thank you for that chant, Peggy, and everyone. That is the chant that we always offer before and after a Zen talk at our Maria Cannon Zen community in Dallas. And if you're to ask me what I am about to convey in this talk that you have invited me to offer tonight is already contained fully in that chant. So I might as well just sit here and let's just listen to that chant over and over again. But somehow we humans need words to help us in finding out what that yearning of our heart is. And yet this practice is an invitation precisely to go beyond words and come back to that silence where we can truly come home and find everything we can ever want or need. That is what our practice is about. Let me begin by, uh, for, of course, thanking everyone. I'm greatly honored and it's a great joy to be invited to offer this talk tonight. I am sorry that to know that ba Valerie seems not to be feeling well tonight. I hope she is better soon and that she will continue with robust health to guide this very great Mountain Cloud Sangha together with Henry, who is, as I see, tuned in from wherever he is right now. Thank you for connecting, Henry, and everyone who is here tonight. The other night, or rather, for some nights after our sit, we have recently begun our in-person sits at our Maria Kanon Zen Center here in Dallas. If we have a few minutes after a short talk that I convey after the regular weekly sit, I ask individuals, please share with us what this practice means to you. And over several nights of what I've heard, some have shared that this practice of finding stillness in their day-to-day -day lives gives them some grounding. It gives them more space in their lives to appreciate what their life is all about. Or some of them say it gives them a focus so that they don't get dispersed and they don't go all over the place. And so on. There are many benefits that people who have begun and have continued this practice find as fruits in their life. And I'm sure that if I ask each and every one of you who are here tonight, you will also have your take on what this practice means to you and how it enriches your life and how it deepens your appreciation of your own life. The other night, as I also asked the same question, there was one young man who's new to the community, but who has been sitting on his own. And finally, he connected with a community, which is us here in Dallas, Maria Cannon Zen Center. And he said, this practice allows him an experience of the infinite. And all of a sudden, my eyes lit up and I said, that's it. You put your finger on it. This practice, in short, is an invitation to experience the infinite. Yes, it does give us a place of stillness and gives us some leeway to be able to enjoy our lives more and so on. All of that is part of the fruit of Zen. But at the heart of this practice is really nothing less than experiencing and opening out to the infinite. Now, what do we mean by that is the question. Let me say some things that I also offer in my day job as teaching world, the world's religious traditions to seminarians, to persons who are preparing for Christian ministry. And I note to them that if you look at the different religions of the world, there is something that propels each of them to go in their various directions. That is the human search for something no less than 
the infinite. Religion precisely is the human search for something that is beyond this finite life, this very, very fragile, volatile, temporary, suffering-laden, contentious and very difficult life that we lead as humans, trying to seek for something that is beyond all of this. And it is that heart that longs for the infinite that is embedded in each and every one of us. The Christian tradition in which I was raised and grew up in and still practice also affirms this in a Latin saying, that derives from the early centuries. I won't repeat the Latin saying, but it's precisely noting that the human being is made for the infinite and nothing will satisfy it less than that infinite reality itself, which in the Christian tradition is called the triune mystery of God. So our hearts are made for the infinite and so our taking up this invitation to sit in stillness and allow ourselves to just be open to that horizon is precisely right on. That's what it's all about. That's the most important thing that we can ever do in this life, to allow ourselves to be open to the infinite. Now, other religions have their various expressions of that. In the Jewish tradition, for example, that realm is so holy and beyond human conception that they did not dare to pronounce the name of that holy one, but they knew how to open their hearts to that, to that presence, to that holy presence in following the rituals following the observances and so on and they knew that they were in the presence of that holy one that is beyond all words and beyond all names in the muslim tradition we hear that there are 99 names for god for the infinite one but there is one name that is unknowable and unpronounceable so that really leaves open that horizon that we humans can never pin down whatever that is that we call the infinite and always, always must remain in awe at its mystery. And it's always receding before us and always going bigger, growing bigger than whatever we can imagine. And that is precisely also what the Hindu tradition points regarding ultimate reality, the ground and goal of all the universe's existence and the, the ground and goal of human existence namely Brahman, the infinite Brahman, which is manifested in all forms and yet which is beyond all form. That infinite Brahman, bigger than anything we can ever imagine. And if you think that, oh, that's it, that's Brahman, oh, that's God, then we've already lost it because it's already bigger than that. So that's the caution that we are invited to keep taking, namely that when we feel we've touched it, we have grasped it, we have experienced it, then we try to frame it in our little conceptual minds and then freeze it and therefore it's no longer that living reality that really is called to vivify our day-to-day -day life. So Zen is about living that infinite reality in the very concrete ways we live our lives from the moment we wake up in the morning, we wash our face, we take our breakfast, we start our work, we do whatever we need to do during that day and so on. And in each and every moment of that life in our day-to-day -day human way of living, we are surrounded by, we are soaked in, we are embraced by that infinite reality that this time of silence allows us to touch or to be touched by. So in Buddhism itself, there are various ways in which they have used words and concepts to refer to that 
reality of the infinite that we can experience directly in our practice of stillness called Zen. One central term that is used, which you've heard most likely often enough in talks given in Zen, or if you've read um, any book about Buddhism, inevitably you will meet the word emptiness or its Sanskrit shunyata. I won't go into a tedious explanation of the background of that, but simply point out that in the word shunyata comes from zero, which is not a negative at all precisely it's zero it's beyond positive and negative and it is that which holds all integers positive and negative together and in doing so the zero holds the entire universe together i'm just speaking in uh, metaphorical or symbolic language here so please uh, stay with me a mathematical exercise is to try to do a division of any number, let's say number one or three or 75 or 7,894,432, uh, whatever number you can take, and let each number correspond to each and every phenomenon that we can find here on Earth, this table, that flower vase, each human being in it, in their uniqueness and in their individuality. Each one of us has a number. In fact, just like in a prison cell where everyone is assigned a number. So you have a number that only you represent in this whole universe. And now, uh, let's say as the Buddhist tradition tells us, the Mahayana tradition tells us, divide that number by zero. What do you have? Just think about it. It's mind boggling. And if you really see it, you will see that one divided by zero is exactly equal to 375 divided by zero or 4,787,435 over zero is also equal. In short, once we revert to and experience that zero-ness that constitutes our very being, then we will see how we are all interconnected in one dynamic, infinite, boundless, and indescribable reality that is not an abstract ideal, but is alive in every here and now. That's what we are invited to experience. A few centuries after the Buddhist Mahayana philosophers came up with this term shunyata or emptiness, there were others who came up with another term. They said, we need a more concrete imagery to convey what the Buddha saw in his moment of enlightenment, which he tried to convey to everyone else and which, he, which is still something that we are inheritors of. That vision of that infinite and boundless reality that is embedded and that is immanent and soaking and soaked in each and every concrete reality on this earth. And they came up with the image of Indra's net, an image that they took from ancient Hindu scriptures about a jeweled net crafted by this divinity named Indra, one of the powerful divinities in the Indian pantheon, who has this creative ability of doing things that uh, make things happen. And so Indra crafted this very, very vast, boundless net. And lo and behold, each eye of that net contains a jewel a shining jewel of different sizes, of different dimensions, different colors, if you will. And so the universe is made up of a vast amount of jewels 
all bonded together in this infinite and vast all-embracing net. Now, if you look at each and every one of those jewels, just take one jewel and look closely, you will see that in that jewel is contained all of the other jewels in that vast net and so on and on without end world without end amen each and every jewel contains everything else that is contained in this whole vast universe that's the vision of the jeweled net of indra that the mahayana buddhists came up with and that's what i'd also like to just offer if you would like an image that will take you to whatever you would like to, uh, or how, how, whatever direction you'd like to take this practice. If you need some images, take that image of looking at one jewel, but don't imagine a jewel. You may do so, but everything around us is a jewel, like this table, this pad of paper, or this book, or that flower vase that's near me. Let me give you a, sen uh, a view of that flower vase. Each and every thing on this visible objective universe is not what it seems. It's actually something that contains everything else in the universe. I learned the same thing, by the way, from a physics professor when I was still teaching at Sophia University before I came to Japan. There was a newly minted professor who had just finished his PhD at the Advanced Institute uh, in Princeton, where Einstein uh, also was for some years, where he discovered his, uh, where, where he came up with his uh, theory of relativity and so on. So this professor, who was also a Jesuit, studied for some years there and received his doctorate. And he was welcomed at Sophia University with an inaugural lecture for his professorship. And I can never forget how he began his lecture. This was in an auditorium of about 200 people, all eager to uh, really listen to what this new professor had to say. And so there was a podium in front of him. And, and before he said anything, he first took a glass of water placed there by the uh, organizers. And then he took a drink from the glass of water. And he said, what I would like to expound to you in my lecture today can be summarized in the fact that this glass of water from which I took a drink is not what you think it is. It's not an objective glass of water that is here in my hand on this particular spot here on top of the podium. In fact, what I will show you through the mathematical equations that I will now unfold and unpack is that this glass of water can only be this glass if you see it in the context of everything else in the universe. In short, this glass is what the universe manifests itself in. So somehow I had already been uh, practicing then for some years then, so when I heard that somehow something clicked. And then he began his mathematical uh, exposition, and I couldn't follow him anymore. So I just stayed with that initial insight and just enjoyed the lecture, not understanding the contents of the math and all that, but simply soaking myself in that initial point that that glass or this table or you, me, everyone else in that room is only what we are precisely because everything else is what what it is, that sense of our intimate interconnectedness with one another. So this physics professor had it. He was, of course, also a spiritual person, uh, a Jesuit for more than uh, a couple of decades before, uh, until then, and now expounding things from a physics point of view. And so in that way he was able to reconcile what science tells us and what religious vision and the spiritual world is really 
inviting us to taste and see. And there are more and more works that precisely attest to the convergence of what we discover in spiritual practice and in religious pursuits with what scientific knowledge is all about. Beyond the usual stereotypes of objectivity and uh, measurability and so on, really at the edge, uh, the cutting edge of science is precisely this awareness that there is this awesome sense of the interconnectedness of everything. So quantum physics is another area that I was fascinated by when I was a youth and I'm just beginning to rediscover that area now. So whenever I can uh, get some time, maybe when I step down from my day job, I'll delve more into quantum physics and get soaked in that also. Exercise my, was it right brain or my exercise my left brain a little bit, which is getting uh, to, uh, to be a little, uh, a little uh, worn and weary. But in any case, that's what we are invited to taste. This reality that we experience right here, right now, is much, much more than what we think it is. It takes us to infinity and beyond, thanks to Buzz Lightyear of Toy Story. It's really infinity, but then if we stop there, we're only agape and looking at the sky and then we're not really living our lives. But it takes us to infinity and beyond. And where is that beyond? Back to the place where we started and know the place for the first time to quote T.S. Eliot in one of his well-known poems. And this time, this place becomes laden with a sense of awesomeness, a sense of holiness, because it is precisely soaked in and manifests and is charged with that infinite power of the interconnectedness of everything else. All this, all this, all these words that I'm saying may seem like gobbledygook if you're just looking at it, analyzing the logic of the contents. But I'm talking on the level of that which those of us who are able to sit in stillness and just allow ourselves to be right here, right now, taking a posture conducive to stillness breathing with awareness and allowing the mind to come home to this present moment know intuitively i'm sure you intuitively know what it's all about and some of you may all also have already been open to that in your own way whether it be through specific guidelines or whether in some way in your youth or uh, earlier life something happened in your life that made you aware of this. There are many books of individuals who suddenly are able to bump into that infinite in, in their lives and it changes them forever. People like, well, Carol Hauslander would be one or uh, who's the author of Pilgrim at the Creek. There are several uh, uh, persons who have written books about their experience and it came to them in an, a spontaneous way or a poet that I can name is Mary Oliver in that regard. And so it is that spark of the infinite that they were able to witness at some point of their lives that then sheds light on the rest of their lives. And so with us, that's an invitation. So how do we, how do we get there? Some people listening to this will say, just like those of us who have been watching that film when Harry met Sally, was that it? And uh, uh, there was this restaurant where uh, Sally was talking to Harry and uh, then she, fa she, she feigned uh, an orgasmic trance and the lady at the next table said, that's what I want also for her restaurant order. So some of you listening may feel, ah, I want that. How can I get that? Well, the guidelines are clear. Take a posture conducive to stillness. 
breathe with awareness. Allow your mind to come and rest in the here and now with every breath. Taste and see. And what awaits? Well, if I may go into some more tedious words about this, as we deepen that sense of just being here and now and not let our mind go here and there, and when it does, by the way, just catch it, note it, don't blame yourself, and just bring it back to the here and now again and again, no matter how many times it needs to uh, be done. But just begin anew every time. And so as we stay in that stillness, somehow that dividing line that separates my egoic consciousness, this egoic self that I ident identify with my name, with my uh, whatever I write in my CV and so on, is all about, and the objective world out there, which I see as outside of me, that boundary, that gap, that wall gradually fades and collapses until there is nothing but dot, dot, dot. I leave you to fill in the blanks. And that's where guideline, a guidance from a teacher can be very crucial so that you will know how to navigate that place when the egoic self and the objective world are no longer two separate realities, but somehow collapse and merge and dissolve. And what happens? There is a word coming from the Greek that's very uh, common in English. The word is ecstasy. That's also the name of a drug, but uh, it has that effect, it seems, on some people, but that's not what I'm referring to. It's standing out of one's normal egoic self, ecstasy, ecstasis, to stand out of your normal self and to really open yourself to the infinite. And that is what the word ecstasy really is. And so we are invited to a life of ecstasy. But it's not just getting out of myself. We have to also go to infinity and beyond. Again, taking Buzz Lightyear. Namely, to land back on this earth where we stand. I uh, like the Spanish word aterrizar, which refers to a plane who, who, that takes off and soars into the sky and freely explores the boundless. And then eventually it has to land and get back to earth so that it can bring the passengers back to their normal lives. And the word ateriz aterrizar, to touch ground and live here and now and struggle with the struggles that we human beings face with this world that is full of conflict and animosity and wars and um, Ukraine and Yemen and other places in Ethiopia and so on. And then the ecological disasters that are looming in front of us if we don't do anything to change our ways structurally and individually, and the other kinds of things that divide us as a human family, as an earth community. That's all part of the pain that we cannot help but experience. And from this vantage point of experiencing the infinite right here, right now, that infinite is not something out there in the abstract, but it is also something that opens our heart to feel that pain of all those that are in pain and also to embrace all of those that are struggling in their lives. Those who were constrained to leave their homes and seek another place to be able to live a decent human life, those that we call the migrants. Millions and millions on this earth in different places, many of them coming, knocking at the borders of this country and so on. Our hearts go out to them because they are no longer some people, uh, some of those who uh, are separate from us, but they're us. They are us. The deteriorating earth is us. The vanishing species, thousands on a yearly basis that disappear from the face of the earth is us. We are all dying. And it is that which then opens a new spark in us 
to invite us to live in a way that in some way might stem that tide of destruction that we are all facing, precisely because we see the infinite right here in our midst in a way that we are able to embrace each and everything, each and everyone in this concrete world as no other than who I am. That's what Zen practice invites us to. So in short, be still. And in that stillness, you will know, taste and see. Thank you. If there is, is this, uh, if this is a part of your uh, custom, I'd like to open the floor for any questions or comments based on what was offered or anything that you'd like to say in, where in, uh, from your own practice. Tell us what this practice is for you and uh, let us know how you have resonated with what was offered today. I don't know how to uh, manage this. So Peggy and uh, Scott, will you please uh, name or rather for those who wish to say something, raise their hand and you will be uh, named by Peggy or Scott and then you can unmute and say what is in your heart, please. Yes, if, if you're on Zoom, uh, please use the raised hand at the bottom of your screen. And if you're here in the Zendo, you can just raise your hand. Hello, my name is Justin Nyberg. Um, I have a question. Um, I really enjoyed your talk today. Um, so Henry's talked about his experience having sort of a, 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 a an experience of the universal infinite personally. Mm -hmm. And I've heard him talk about accessing that sort of experience of the infinite through a Zen practice. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that you need to um, achieve that experience as a goal um, in order to realize the benefits of the Zen practice um, for realizing uh, compassion, um, the disappearance of otherness, and all the benefits that you recommend? Do you have to reach that goal in order to um, achieve that compassion? Thank you for your question, Justin. If I may speak from um, the heart in that way, it's not an achievement at all. It is something that is already being made available to us. Now, all we need to do is really get rid of all the obstacles that prevent us from realizing that which is already there knocking at our door. And what are those obstacles? This false sense of self, this sense of lack that I feel in myself, this sense of separation from others, this um, sense that I need to prove myself and achieve something so that I can be someone whom people will respect and so on. And so what our Zen practice enables us to is really a letting down or letting go of those little uh, spots of mud that have prevented, uh, that continue to prevent us from being transparent to reality as it is. So I always um, repeat to those who ask me in Doksan and in, uh, in talks that Zen is not an achievement contest. It's not doing something so that you can attain a goal but it is simply an acceptance of an invitation to open my heart to that which is already there waiting for, for me to realize. Now, each one of us 
would have our own load of karma that we've carried from birth or even before birth on, and that's what we need to deal with. We may have a lot of, we may have had a lot of traumas in our childhood or recent issues in our uh, relationships and so on, and that's what we carry. And somehow those can be blocks to us from arriving at that point of stillness where we're free to see what is in the most obvious kind of way. So we need to deal with those issues first. So that's why for some people, it may take more time than others. But it's not a matter of achievement. It's a matter of, in fact, de-achieving and taking off whatever load is there that prevents me from arriving at that which is really my true home. Now, well, easier said than done. Now, uh, really, how do we get there? And some of you may be so eager and uh, you want to do everything so that you can get it. But it's also not a matter of getting it. It's perhaps what I can say as a matter of letting go, which reminds me of something I also wanted to offer earlier as a practical set of guidelines. How do we get there to what I just talked about, that sense of the infinite in my life, in my day-to-day -day life? Well, this practice of taking time to just be still in a posture conducive to that stillness, breathing with awareness and coming home to the here and now is a most effective and direct way of allowing that to happen. So be patient, just continue that doggedly day by day and allow your heart to open up. And before you know it, something might happen and you realize, oh, that's it, I knew it all the time. Another added way in which we can enhance that sense of being present so that we might be more, more vulnerable and more open to that realization of that infinite that is always impinging upon us is by stopping every now and then when we're doing something in our day-to-day -day life, like we're on our computer writing an email and then we finish with one. Before you go to the next, take a deep breath and just pause and be aware of the here and now or you're doing chores at home, like washing dishes or uh, taking care of uh, kids. So every now and then when you get a chance, just pause and take a deep breath and enjoy the scenario and then continue with whatever you're doing. Those little moments of stillness can continue to remove the, 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 the little stains of mud or blocks that prevent us from seeing the infinite in the here and now. And they uh, make us more prone to really being present in a way that our heart is more vulnerable to being touched by the infinite. And here's another one. I would like to suggest for those of you who are really earnest in your practice, to begin your day from the moment you wake up your eyes open, you're still in bed, now you realize, aha, it's a new day. And as soon as you're able, get out of bed and make a prostration. You may have to go to the bathroom first so that you can do it uh, without uh, feeling that uh, uh, inner pressure. But the very first thing you do, that you're able to do after you wake up, is get up and make so uh, you're used to prostrations when we sit together in the zendo you know you you, uh, you are uh, aware of that practice of making deep prostrations it's not worshiping something outside of you it's not doing anything that is that need be interpreted in uh, uh, a way that you're uh, giving um, uh, uh, giving some kind of religious uh, uh, act and so on you may of course do so but you can take it as an invitation to empty yourself of the egoic self, to empty yourself of all the karmic hindrances that still prevent you from realizing that infinite that is always in our midst. And so in making that prostration, we lift up our palms facing upwards with our head on the floor. And then as we continue up, then just take a deep breath what I do myself is I open my arms like that and just allow myself to be surrendered to that infinite. And since I 
am a practicing Christian coming from the Jesuit tradition. I utter words that I learned from my Jesuit tradition coming out of that unconditional love of God. And so I, uh, I name that unnameable holy in the terms that I am used to in my Christian tradition and offer myself to that holy one and allow and 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 ask that i become an embodiment of that holy one in the day in the way i live my life today just one day at a time that's a concrete suggestion if you're if you don't if you don't have a religious perspective fine just try that prostration and see what it might do to you in terms of your being able to truly feel free from the egoic self and now living only in the light of the flow of that infinite that propels us from moment to moment. And so with that, then our hearts are somehow cleansed. And before you know it, or not before you know it, but you will realize it. Somehow there's a quiet joy that comes when you know that you have released yourself and you're now living no longer for your little self, but for whatever comes each moment. And so the coffee tastes much better than uh, the morning looks much crisper and so on, even if it's raining sometimes. And every day will become something that you will treasure and welcome with gratitude. Anyway, just some practical suggestions for enhancing that. And as we continue to do these practices, those kinds of things that we are able to in our freedom, then somehow our heart opens up and the window of that opening to the infinite may come anytime. And for many of you, I'm sure it has already come. It's all I, it all just needs to be articulated. It needs to be um, seen in a proper way with the guidance of a teacher, hopefully. But in any case, it's an ongoing invitation. Yes, Ryan. Hi, thank you very much for this talk, I'm really getting quite a lot out of it. I'm sure everyone else is as well. My question is about active deconditioning of cultural, uh, I suppose, linguistic habits. So our language is self-referential -refer a lot of the time. I refer to myself as I. We're reinforcing a small me by name in every exchange and in every interaction. There's a utility to that. And I suppose it's not going to be practical to try to reinvent a language or, or engage in the world in a way that is absent of that conceptual framework. But in private, do you think it's helpful to remind yourself in small moments, not Ryan, not I? Aha, uh -huh. that's a good suggestion. I have not thought about that, but that might be a help for some individuals. Just in some private moments when you are sitting, for example, maybe that's one, that's, that, that might be something you could take as a koan. When you're sitting there, just breathing in and breathing out. Not me, not Ryan, not Ruben. And so you empty yourself of a concept that you're used to in your day-to-day -day life and in doing so what will come and replace it you're opening your your heart up to something that is yet uncharted so that might be an adventure try that ryan and let us know what happens later thank you even without a question. Can anyone share anything that has happened in your practice that somehow resonates with what I sought to offer today? Little brushes of the infinite. Feel free to share with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valerie. 
sitting here together. Was that Scott or was that the real Valerie? <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Johanna. Please go ahead. Johanna. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, having done Henry's course for the last year, the, the thing that's been so important to me is that I just have glimpses of the infinite all the time, I feel. Um, just I've noticed the clouds as I never did before. Um, I notice my cat. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's just these, and it's just tiny glimpses in the real life. Um, the wonder as I'm washing the dishes of the water coming out, and and I think it's yes, it's just being aware of the miraculous mm -hmm. makes me feel that I'm aware of the infinite. Excellent. Um, and um, and I'm also deeply grateful for having established finally a real practice, which is which is wonderful thank you for your talk i've gotten a great deal out of it and we'll start my mornings with the prostration i'm Good. very very happy Hope to we can meet again that. sometime and uh, you can tell us how whether and how it's made a difference thank you listening tonight and who wish to try it thank I hope you we have another opportunity let us know sometime later but thank you thank john you. thank you so much thank you and let me also tell you a secret which is really an open secret Another name for that infinite that I'm talking about is original love. This is a PR for Henry. <laughs> Anyways, really, you, have, you, you put your finger on it also. That's what we are about. And if I may put it in the Christian terms that I am familiar with, the words that come out for me are the affirmation to each and every one of us that you are beloved unconditionally you are cared for you matter in this universe just because you are you and that's the message that this encounter with the infinite is conveying to us so we're invited to just open our hearts and listen to that affirmation and once we hear that there's really nothing else that we could ever want or need of course, we would have our daily needs of our food and shelter and clothing and so on. But that fills our heart in a way that it overflows. And now all we can do is to live a life giving myself as a gift to others in the way that I may be a little more useful to alleviating the pain or make or helping in the well-being of others. That's the kind of life that this Zen practice is leading us to. So let's continue our practice and allow it to fill our hearts with that joy and gratitude and inner peace and compassion that moves us to move mountains and move the structures in the world that block that peace, that joy from coming to each and every sentient being here on earth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, also. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Brianna. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the talk tremendously. I'm a student of Tibetan Buddhism, but everything that you've said tonight really resonates with me, and there are so many similarities. Um, I haven't found that we speak at all about having any type of goal. At all, it is purely a practice that helps me and and I imagine everyone that has a practice to open up and be present for what is needed from everyone that we meet to have an openness. Thank you. I may I know who that person who was speaking 
uh, is. I am not seeing you on my screen. A uh, Marilyn, a uh, Marilyn. There's a picture of my cat. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you so very much. This is the first talk that I've ever experienced here at Mountain Cloud. And oh, I'm very grateful. Welcome to Mountain to Cloud, you. then. I hope you keep coming. I will. I promise I will. Good. So, Brianna, ha Brianna has her hand up. Please go ahead. Hello, Ruben. Thank you so very much for your talk tonight. And one of the things I'm really appreciating is um, how clearly you are you are are steeped in academia and um, the you know your intellect is is well developed and yet you have heart and you're still connected to the infinite. And I was graced with a an experience of a great opening in 2000 and it was extraordinary and but then I got into academia PhD psychoanalyst and I, it wasn't until I met Henry and heard original love where I felt oh I, I I'm there's there's a way back in because I was afraid I was starting to lose my connection so I'm just very inspired and appreciative of meeting somebody who's been able to find that balance and connect those threads. Mm, thank you, Brianna, for that affirmation. It can be a challenge if you're using your left brain a lot. We tend to get uh, muddled up in it. So we need the space to be able to take a deep breath and look at that and say, aha, this is what matters and not the kind of analytic things that I come up with and so on. But anyway, um, thank you so much for noting that. But we all need to use both, our, both sides of our brain. So don't neglect one or the other, but there are times when we need to emphasize one more than the other precisely. If there are some of you interested in this left brain, right brain uh, dynamics, there is a TED talk by Jill Bolte Taylor called um, a, uh, what was that again? Stroke uh, of Insight. Stroke of Insight. Yes, thank you very much. Please check that out. It's a 17 or 18 minute talk about her own time when her left brain got clogged because of a stroke and her right brain was just opened up. And uh, that same capacity is in all of us to see those wondrous things that are already there if we are able to silence the left brain a bit every now and then. So without having a, a stroke through uh, a blood clot and so on, what Zen allows us to is precisely allow that left brain to quiet down and just be still and allow it to just rest so that the other side of us, the heart function can open up and be touched by that infinite reality, that original love that we are all about. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brianna. Have we reached our time at eight o'clock or uh, seven o'clock your time? Yes, we have. Thank you so much, Ruben. Thank you. Yeah, such a great joy. Everything to, to hear the content that you're conveying, the world you're conveying, but it comes through just in your voice. Thank you, Valerie. And are you well? Um, well, I just have a really bad cold and I didn't want to, um, mm -hmm. you know, expose anybody. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. I hope you get better soon. Oh, thank, thank you. Me. Thank you so much. So, Peg, do you want to close us out? I will do that. The four great vows. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. 
The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Mm -hmm.